Hey guys, good morning, God bless you. Great to have you joining us this morning. It is really, really great to just get into the Word of God and that's what we're going to do. Don't forget, you can look up Effective Life Church on our YouTube page, on our website, www.effectivelifechurch.org and uh, you can see any of the series that you might have missed. Also, you can look up my own ministry on www effectivelifeministry.com and uh, again you can be able to get some resources there as well. I hope that you are really really receiving through this series and as we get into the word of God you know our experience as Christians is ever growing. Are we perfect? No. Do we falter? Yes. Do we stumble? Yes. But it is an onward going journey you know, that we get up again, that we march forward again. When we when we drop the ball, it's not over forever. You know, you pick that up, you try and learn from it and you move on. And you experience the wonderful grace and love of God. And that's what we see in the Abraham story with Sarah. They're experiencing the grace of God in spite of their own weaknesses, in spite of their own uh, wrong decision making yet the love of God is maintained through their entire lives. It's just incredible to me. Uh, it really speaks to me that God's love is not dependent on me, but rather it's dependent on him. And often we can be in a work mode mentality in trying to earn God's love when it's through Jesus we've received God's love. Your value was already decided before Jesus died at the cross. Wow, that's just incredible. So I encourage you, we're going to jump into uh, part eight today, and it's God's sovereignty through Abraham and Sarah. And we're looking at Genesis chapter 18 today, or the end of 17 and chapter 18. So Father, I pray that you will equip us through your word, strengthen us, change us as people, help us, Lord, to become the people you want us to be, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So last week we saw the, that uh, God went through some of the specifics of the covenant with Abram and Sarah. And in actual fact, there was a name change in that covenant that uh, Sarai would become Sarah and that Abram would become Abraham. And they received the letter H from God's name. And also God uh, becomes known as the God of Abraham. When you read the, New, the Old Testament from this point on, often is referred to, are you not the God of Abraham? And you see this wonderful covenant taking place that God instituted. Uh, the rest of where we left off from Genesis 17 said that Abraham laughed to himself regarding the promise that him and Sarah were both well past the age of bearing children. He asked if Ishmael could be the chosen one, as like, uh, if you like, the child of promise instead. And Abraham was willing to put up with that, to say, well, you know, almost don't worry about the promise. We've already got uh, Ishmael. Why don't we just... Why don't we just go with what Sarah's idea was and, and use this Ishmael? But God says no, and he rejects that idea. And uh, God reassures Abraham of the promise that Ishmael will be a great nation and uh, so on and so forth and will be blessed. But then God says that he will establish the covenant through Abraham and Sarah for the offspring. So it was never going to be Abraham... And Hagar, it, it couldn't be. That wasn't what God had ordained in the first place. It was always going to be Abraham and Sarah's offspring. So you see, Sarah's just as important in this as Abraham. And God also tells Abraham to call his son Isaac, and that would be, uh, and that he would be born around a year later. And after God leaves Abraham, immediately Abraham obeys and fulfills the requirement of the covenant that God had instituted, which was circumcision. And Abraham then goes on to circumcise all his household as well as himself. So we're going to jump into chapter 18, 
Genesis chapter 18 and verse 1. And we're going to see again this week, what can we learn? Your, your Christian walk and experience is about learning. You've never made it. You've never got there. You know, that's impossible because you face different challenges each year. You know, the challenges of 2018 are totally different to the challenges of 2021. Now, the Word of God is identical. It's the same. But as you read it, you might apply it differently uh, to your circumstance because your circumstance is now different, you know. And, you know, so... It, it, often we, we don't read stuff that we've already read because we feel, well, I've read that. I've, I've, I know that story. But you're not in the same place. And there could be fresh gold. There could be new revelation. You know, so I always encourage people, even if you've read stories, you know, and parables and, you know, the, the, the New Testament epistles, just, just allow yourself to be open to what God is saying for today. So Genesis 18, verse 1. The Lord appeared to Abram near the trees of Marai while he was sitting at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. Abram looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and then bowed low to the ground. So Abram has fixed his tent. It's, you know, it's, the, it's the, the, the hottest part of the day. It's midday. And he's just chilling out. He's maybe he's a bit Spanish. He's having a siesta in the sun. And suddenly, from his tent, he sees three men turn up. But there is something about them that causes Abram to bow in their presence. You know, Abram doesn't just do anything, but he says he bows low to the ground. So he really probably prostrated himself and laid on the ground completely rather than just bending over, doing a little bow. He probably laid on the ground completely. Now, out of the three men, we know one was the pre Christ and the other two were angels. We saw an appearance, an appearance of the pre Christ with Hagar when he saw Hagar in Genesis in the desert in, uh, in Genesis 16. And now... Uh, now Christ is appearing to Abraham. Verse 3. And he said, this Abraham talking, If I have found favour in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought out, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat, so that you can be refreshed, and then go on your way. Now that you have come to your servant, very well, they answered, do as you say. Now, hospitality was a massive, massive thing in the Jewish culture. And hospitality is still important today. But in the, the times of Abraham in the Middle East, a person's reputation often depended on their ability to show hospitality sharing their homes, sharing their food with strangers and treating them as honoured guests. You know, they weren't just anyone, but really showing honour to people. And it was a real delight. They were delighted to entertain. As in this day and age, the doorbell goes and you're probably thinking, oh, pants. Oh, no, who's that? I was just about to do something. Or you get a text message saying somebody's going to come mad, not in covid uh, somebody's going to come round under normal circumstances to visit. And often, rather than being excited and having the joy of relationship, it's actually a burden. You, you feel burdened by it. It's an effort you've now got to make. The whole joy of relationship uh, and uh, communicating in that way, we're being robbed of in this modern day life. And I encourage you, be hospitable. Uh, Abraham said, my Lord, and he bowed to the ground. He called himself your servant. This was a greeting of respect for special visitors. Offering them water for their feet was an act of courtesy to refresh the traveller on this hot and dusty climate. 
And, you know, it, it was a very common thing for your feet to be washed. Even Jesus with the disciples, he washed their feet. And, and generally, it would be the job of a servant to wash the feet of the master. So when Jesus did this, he was saying, look, you know, I've come to serve you. I've come to be a blessing to you. I'm not so up myself that everything's got to be done for me. I actually want to do this for you. And Jesus served his disciples and those around him. And it's very important in uh, churches and church leadership that, you know, we, as you become leaders in church, it's very easy not to serve anymore. And it's important to keep that serving heart, especially if you're in full-time ministry. It can be difficult because you might be paid by your ministry or by the church and you work kind of nine to five or what your working hours are on Sunday, da, 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 da. And if you look at it, you probably are working like somebody might work in Tesco's or uh, somebody who's a banker. And in actual fact, your serving is wrapped up in what you're employed to do. And there's no serving outside of that. And it's important that we remain servant-hearted. Leaders are servants. We are there to serve the body of Christ. Uh, I remember when I was in Macedonia years ago and, uh, you know, I was on a refugee camp and there were like 40,000 refugees, just tents everywhere. And this was when the Kosovan war was on and we were on the Kosovan border uh, on a refugee camp and there were thousands of people and they had nothing because they'd been ferried across the border with just, you know, a couple of carrier bags of of their worldly goods, that was it. They had to get out of the country desperately. And as they were coming onto the refugee camp, they were allocated into a tent. And, you know, I can remember saying, you know, Lord, what, what, what do you do? Where do you go? How do you handle this situation when they're going through such poverty, such heartache, such abuse? They're, they're, they're victims of war. Uh, many of them have been abused, raped, uh, many of them were looking for family members who had been murdered and they were literally just coming off the coaches uh, into the refugee camp. And I remember walking round and I went into one family's tent and they met me, this shocked me, they met me with such hospitality because each family were given a basic uh, pack when they arrived of uh, coffee, and uh, different bits and pieces uh, to get them going, like a starter pack. And as I went in, they, they ushered me in. They didn't want me to, to be put out in any way. And they were making me coffee. It was the strongest coffee I've ever had in my life. But from, from the little that they had, they wanted me to be a blessing. And not only that, they were then calling people from other tents to come and join us to, to meet this visitor from England, and it was absolutely amazing. And we ended up having a time of worship, sharing our testimonies, and leading people to Christ in the middle of a refugee camp in near Kosovo with UN helicopters hovering above, and we're sharing the gospel and this amazing hospitality and seeing salvation. Wow. Absolutely incredible, I tell you. Hospitality is so important. And these people in uh, these war-torn countries knew hospitality. The, uh, uh, Peter, the apostle, encourages us to be hospitable. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9 reads, Practice hospitality towards one another. Now, it doesn't mean sit at do indoors and practice when people come round and what am I going to do. It means do this regularly. Do this, let this become your norm. Do it regularly. And in each instant, do not do it grudgingly, but cordially. So, you know, even in the New Testament, we see the importance of hospitality within the body of Christ. And, you know, Scripture says, you know, uh, the world will know the Lord through your love for one another. Well, how is that love shown? Well, it's shown when we meet up and when we have family 
time and friendship time and hospitality to one another. Not when we're whinging and complaining and it's too much work to serve one another. So it's very, very important, the gift of hospitality towards each other. And we, we need to really work on that because it's an expression of love. Hospitality is an expression of love. And it's not based on the value or the amount that you have. Be willing to use whatever you have to be a blessing to somebody else. Uh, sometimes you, you, you can do prayer meetings and uh, you can have people maybe who are not very confident and don't really pray very much. And they can think, well, what's the point of me? Because I don't really pray. I'm not very confident. I can't really see the purpose. I don't add anything. Well, let me say you do. Because just by your very presence, you are encouraging those who do speak aloud or pray aloud. And just by being there, you are showing unity in the body of Christ. You're showing that you're supporting and that you're loving, irrespective. So I encourage you. Now, Abram acted as if he would be favoured if they would allow them, allow him to serve them. Abraham acted as if he was being favoured by being allowed to serve. It was a, that big a deal. And sometimes with us in our serving, it is hard work and it's putting you out and all that sort of thing. And rather than serving, thinking, wow, I'm, I'm being allowed to be part of their setup team or a team or put out the chairs or do the offering or whatever it is, and having that mentality that it's actually a joy, it's a privilege to serve. You know, if the Queen was going to come to your house or some big famous film star that you really uh, admire, you would want to serve them. You'd want to be the one in the kitchen. You'd want to be the one who was blessing them. Why? Because of their notoriety and you admire them. Well, that should be the same with one another. Why? Because that person's got Christ Jesus in them which is far better than any queen or rock star, pop star, or film star. So, we've got to always check our heart in serving. Sometimes it's sacrificial. We, we, a lot of the time in today's life, we serve at, in our own time and from our own place of comfort. We give from our own place of comfort. But serving in the body of Christ often is to serve at an inconvenience. It's not a convenient time for you to have to do this. It's not a comfortable time. And it's going to mean you're going to have to change your priority. But see, Jesus is always the one that we should change our priority to. You know, we've got to have a subservient attitude that says, you know, I'm willing to change my diary to make your life more convenient. What's going to work best for you? And... Uh, and I love one of the guys in our church, or a couple of the guys in our church, they always have that mentality. What's going to work for you and I'll work around that. And it's just really lovely and refreshing. Philippians 2.14 says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. And that's just a lovely reminder. You know, we can undo that lovely servant heart by then whinging about it. Oh, yeah, 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 I, just, I do this, I do that, but I don't like it, and I have to get there early, and this, that, and the other, and you're just complaining and moaning, but you're losing the joy in the serving. Hebrews 6, verse 10 says, God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love that you have shown him as you have helped them, his people, and continue to help them. So that's an amazing scripture because we often think we're, we're loving God just by our own relationship. But according to scripture, it says, God is not unjust. He will not forget the work and the love that you have shown him as you have helped his people and continue to help them. So I can show love to God through being a blessing to the congregation and other people I meet online and other people I meet in life. And by me doing that, I'm blessing God. And God says, look, I'm not going to forget this. It's going to your merit. It's not forgotten. It's going to your merit. You're going to be rewarded. You're going to be blessed for this. Absolutely wonderful. So we serve man or we serve God through man, you know, 
I've served leaders in the past with all of my heart, with every bit of my heart. Not because they were canonised or so fantastic, but I was serving God through the person God had put in my life. And it's a joy to do it. When you can grasp that revelation of servanthood through one another, you're moving to a new, new dimension of servanthood and a new dimension of the world because God says he is not unjust. He will not forget the work and the love you have shown him. You know, when you have young children and it's their birthdays, it, it's a blessing to buy presents for them and make a fuss of them. But it's also a blessing when other people do it. It blesses you when somebody else blesses your child. You get something out of that. Why? Because you love your child. Hebrews 13 verse 1 says, Keep loving each other, brothers. Do not forget to entertain strangers. For by doing this, some have entertained angels without even knowing. Wow, that's incredible. That's wonderful. You know, you, you don't know. Somebody might have come into your life, your church, your workplace, and in actual fact, you've been really helpful to them and blessed them. The other day, uh, not to blow my own trumpet, but just to emphasise the point, the other day I went to the bottle bank and do the recycling, get rid of a few bottles, and as I pulled up, I could see an old man in front of me and he was old. I mean, this, this was an old guy. He must have been well into his 80s. And as I pulled up, uh, he was getting a black bag out of, his, out of his car. And I got my little bag, did my bottles, chucked them all in quick, jumped back in the car. And then I looked at him and thought, Do you know, what? I didn't even think to offer to help him. And I quickly got out of the car. I said, you all right, mate? Can I give you a hand? And he went, oh, cheers. Thank you. Thank you. And he had, man alive, so many bottles. It looked like he'd come from a factory. And he had sackfuls of bottles. So I was chucking them all the way into the different coloration for him. And I said, well, you've got a lot there, mate. And he said, yeah, most of them are my mother's. Mucking around, because he was 80-odd. And we had a giggle, and then uh, off I went. I don't know if that was an angel. It could have been an angel. Who knows? See, you don't know. So, keep on loving, let's remember. Let's jump back to Genesis 18, verse 6. Genesis 18, verse 6. Now, we spent some time on that because it is an important characteristic in Abram that we can learn from. Abraham hurried to, into the tent to Sarah. Quick, he said, gather three shares of fine flour and knead them and bake some bread. Now, a share is a measure. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and he gave it to the servant who hurried to prepare it. So he rushed quickly to Sarah, okay, and then he ran to the herd to give it to the servant who hurried to prepare it. Then he bought some curds and some milk and a calf that had just been prepared and set these before them. Whilst they ate, he stood near them under the tree. So you see, what he was going to do, he, he knew the time to do it quick. And sometimes we can be a bit wet. We don't read the timings of things. We miss the timing of something. But Abraham knew, if I'm going to bless these guys, they're on a journey, I've got to get on with this and I've got to do it now. Do not delay. If he had delayed, he might have missed the opportunity completely and missed what God was going to do. And sometimes we delay. And we've got to be more proactive in ministry, in life, in relationships. Stop putting everything off. Okay? And delay can end up causing a complete missing out of what God has. So you've got to be able to read God's timing. Jesus knew the timing. He knew and he said to his mother when, when it was the wedding feast, he said, now is not my time. But when he was getting ready to be arrested, he knew and he said, now is the time of evil men. So you've got to know, we've got to be in sync. And that comes through sensitivity. You're not going to be in sync if, you, if you're not reading your word or worshipping or praying regularly, whatever, you're going to miss it. Okay? Or spending time with other believers. Now, this shows Abraham was a diligent servant. 
He knew how to serve these men and he served with the finest. He didn't say, oh, just get some, have we got anything left over? Have we got any pizza left over from last night? Is there anything we can just chuck to get? He was giving his best and he was overseeing it personally. It said he waited under the tree and you imagine him like a servant, like a waiter in a restaurant, just there, just ready, making sure they've got all they need, they've, they've got what they, they wanted, they're enjoying what they've got. And sometimes it's good to serve one another and the leaders above us and honour those. Abraham was a diligent servant. He knew how to act, he picked the best calf, he told Sarah to get the finest flour, he didn't give the leftovers of yesteryear, he served them himself, he didn't get his servants to do it on his behalf, he was going to do this, and verse 8 shows that he waited on them. Abraham displayed excellence in service, and we can follow Abraham's example and attitude of excellence in service to those around us, to those that God has put in your life. You know, let's serve each other in excellence. No, that's not good enough. I want to give my best in this situation or to this person. If you were to go and visit Buckingham Palace on a tour, you'd be shown around by a tour guide who worked. But if you were a head of state or somebody important, then in actual fact, it would be the royal family. It would be the queen herself or Prince Charles or one of the senior members of the family who would show you around. You wouldn't be shown around just by anyone. Why? Because you're too important. See, and the importance placed upon uh, uh, these three men was displayed by Abraham because he was doing this. And it was important to do it right. You know, I'm not very good at cooking. But you know what? There are a couple of dishes I know I can cook well. And I, it's hard work, but I like doing it for people to really just bless them, you know? So verse 9. Uh, where is your wife Sarah? They asked him. There in the tent, he said. Notice that they, they called her Sarah and not Sarai because she had a new identity. She was now a princess. She wasn't this woman of torment anymore. She was a princess, and they called her by who she was in God. Now, in actual fact, she was still behaving like Sarai. She was still unbelieving. She was still critical, but she had become Sarah, and they called her as Sarah. Don't let our mistakes drag us back. Verse 10. Then the Lord said, I will surely return to you about this time next year, and Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance of the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already old and well advanced in years, and Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I am worn out and my master is old, will I now have this pleasure? And Sarah laughed at the temporary, uh, in disbelief. She just laughed. She thought, do you know what? Yeah, right. Fat chance of that. And there were two major issues. One, she was barren. So whether she was 90 years old, which she was, or whether she was 35 years old, she was barren anyway. She couldn't have children. So the barrenness was one massive hurdle. The second one was her body wasn't producing eggs anymore. She'd passed that season in her life. Her ovaries didn't work anymore. They weren't fruitful anymore. No women at all have given birth at the age of 90. So she laughed to herself. So God reminds both Abraham and Sarah through this rhetorical question, is anything too hard for the Lord? This shows that God knows every thought of our heart. He is all knowing. And he wasn't even in her presence, yet he knew that she laughed in her heart. And God knows our heart. 
You know, he knows our every thought, our strengths and our weaknesses. Psalm 139 verse 23 says, Search me, O God. This is David crying out, Search me, O God. Know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Now he was saying to God, I'm not perfect. Test me. Know my anxious thoughts. He was saying, I'm worried. I'm anxious. I'm not perfect, Lord. I need you to lead me in what is the way ever, everlasting, to everlast, to lead me in faith, to guide me, because I know my anxious heart myself. I know my weaknesses. I know the area of weakness. I know where I get tempted. I know where I drop the ball and I've done this or I've done that and I shouldn't have, Lord. Lead me. And that's what he cried. Sarah laughed at God, at God's twice given promise. We might think that God would have turned around and said, well, stuff you, Sarah. I'll take the promise away. If you don't believe me, fine. Don't have the promise. Hey, God, we'll use your child instead. Or do you know what? Blow Abraham and Sarah. I'm fed up with the pair of them. Let's go find someone else. It's not like I haven't got any other people to use. And, and in life, when we do wrong, when we sin, when we falter, there's this tendency to punish to reject and to punish. And that religious spirit thrives through the church. And instead of there being an outpouring of love and covenantedness, there's, there's a, a pouring out of rejection and a pouring out of punishment. You know, And we end up punishing that, what Jesus has already been punished for. If you've sinned, in your life and you become a Christian, Jesus died on the cross and has received already the punishment for the sin that you will do in 2021. Jesus has already been punished on your behalf for that sin. And yet we go round punishing one another on something that God has already forgiven them for and says, I remember it no more. Now, of course, there must be fruit and repentance. God didn't punish them by taking away the promise. God instead responded uh, by dealing with her sin of unbelief and doubt. But he didn't take away the promise. He acknowledged, he said, look, Sarah, you've got unbelief, you've got doubt. But he didn't take away the promise. Sarah laughed with scepticism. Towards the promise. This, yeah, right, sarcastic. Yeah, right, all right then, whatever. God is sovereign. And he said that she would have a baby and that was it, it was going to happen. And God's sovereignty outruled her doubt. Yes, she had doubt, but God was sovereign. And God had already said. Although Sarah had a B plan, God's plan was going to prevail irrespective. It didn't matter what she decided to do. Ultimately, God's plan would come about for Israel to be a chosen people. This is 18.15. Sarah was afraid, so she lied and said, but I didn't laugh. But he said, yes, you did laugh. Have you done that? You're embarrassed. You're embarrassed, you say, oh, I, I, I didn't do it when you did. But you're embarrassed about how you're going to be treated. You know, David turned mad and he said to God, that, please, Lord, will you deal with me? Do not let me fall into the hands of men. I want to face you for judgment, not, not mankind, because you'll treat me with compassion and love. They will not. They'll ridicule me. I'm, I, I'll be, it's not good for me. Will you judge me, oh God? Now, most of us would turn around and say, well, I don't want to be judged by God. Oh, the big ogre. But in actual fact, God judges us from a place of love. And he has judged us. And Jesus has paid the price. Wonderful. There's no place to hide from God. We can stick our memories under the carpet. You can turn around and say, oh, well, I didn't know that. And we can make our excuses. But Jeremiah 23, 24 says, can anyone hide in a secret place so that God cannot see him, declares the Lord? 
Do I not fill the heavens and the earth, declares the Lord? You can run, but you can't hide. You've heard the saying. Psalm 139, David again, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths of the earth, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, or if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your, your right hand will hold me fast. Wow. Wow, isn't that wonderful? He's not going to drop you. He's not going to let you go because you made a mistake or you chose the wrong thing. He loves you. It's a covenant. He's not going to drop you one day, pick you up the other because now you're behaving. Drop you again. Pick you up. Drop you again. Pick you up. He hadn't given us a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and sound mind. And for Abram and Sarah, they must have looked at wonder when the child of promise was born. Not just at the miracle of this baby being born, but the miracle of their relationship with God. They didn't deserve this. They didn't even believe for this. They treated it with mockery and laughed. Yet God did not punish them by taking away the calling. And God's not a God who punishes us by taking away our calling or desire. The calls of God are irrevocable, and some say irreversible. He is an eternal God, and what he gives is eternal. God knew Sarah's innermost thoughts, despite the doubt and scepticism that she had, despite her laughter, did not take away that promise. He showed mercy towards Abraham and Sarah. He showed love. He showed kindness. His grace covered their doubt. Hallelujah. His grace covered their doubt. Sometimes we can have doubts because we've been through disappointments. We've been hurt. We've been let down with whatever it was. And doubts can come in and we can doubt even God's love sometimes or doubt our purpose. But I encourage you, you don't need to. Trust God. Trust God. Abraham accepted God's sovereignty in some areas of his life when it came to leaving Haran and going to the promised land with his descendants and so on and so forth. Uh, but he, along with Sarah, doubted God when it came to other areas of his life. Like, he didn't, I suppose he didn't think God would provide for him and he went down to Egypt because of the famine and different little situations. And, and we're very much like that ourselves. You know, we have pockets of unbelief or pockets of doubt, you know. And that's where we can sharpen one another because your area of doubt might be my area of strength. But my area of doubt might be your area of strength. My weaknesses may be your strength, but your weaknesses, that's where I'm strong. And the church of Christ coming together, supporting one another, is a powerful, powerful thing. And God loved them. And it's so easy to forget that. God loved them, loved them, despite the fact that they were doubting God Almighty, despite the fact that Jesus had had manifest before them, despite the fact of angelic visitation, despite the fact of giving them wealth and everything else, there were still pockets of doubt. And that might be you today. Maybe there's pockets of doubt, and you need to address that, and you need to say, like David said, know my anxious thoughts, know my doubts, Lord. Lead me in the way everlasting. Lead me in the way of faith, Lord. Cause faith to stir up within me, Lord. I want to honour you. Where I'm weak, I don't want to keep tripping. I want to be stronger, you know? And, and go to God with those things that you might need to get strengthened in. Know God's love and his promises towards you. He's faithful. His promises are new every morning and great is his faithfulness. They don't run out. It doesn't like a jacket or a t-shirt, wear out and become thin and eventually get hold in. Promises of God aren't like that. They're everlasting. Romans 10 verse 17 says, Faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. Some translation says, Faith comes through hearing and hearing the word of God. 
and that strengthens our faith. And just by studying the life of Abraham and Sarah, we can, we can take strength from that. It can bless you. We can have a greater understanding of God and his character. Lovely. Faith has to be exercised in, in order to grow. And we need to exercise our faith through our prayer, our worship, and situations that we faith, uh, face. Do you spend most of your time feeding your doubts or feeding your faith? They both need feeding. And you, you feed one more than the other. Look to feed the faith. As I've already said, iron sharpens iron. Be with people who will help you, equip you, encourage you, challenge you. And lastly, do we need to just say to the Lord, give me, give me a fresh attitude in serving. I want to serve you by serving my brethren. I want to serve you like Abraham served you, Lord. I want, I want you to be not a tourist at the palace of my life, but I want you to be the head of state. And I want to prepare the way. I want to prepare the path of my life for you to manifest, for you to enjoy. And he does enjoy you. And that's why he purchased you. Isn't it wonderful? You know, the value God placed on you is it, it, it's beyond measure. You can't quantify it. It's incredible. Wow. And don't forget, the enemy will use things around us to hinder us, you know, and, and the whole uh, coronavirus season has been a real hindrance for the church. But has it also been a test for the church of where we're really at? Are we, are we encouraging each other still? Are we being faithful and listening to the word? Or do we think, oh, it's lovely, we've got six months off of church, I can, I can take it easy. Or are we faithful in watching online and communicating, encouraging one another. Do you know what? God loves you, and that's why he loves being with you. So I encourage you, don't doubt that he's going to punish you. Don't get into that mode. Thank God. Have a thankful heart for his love for you. So we're going to carry on our journey, walking with Abraham. Uh, I think there's a series called Walking with Dinosaurs with David Attenborough. But this is Walking with Abraham, with the Lord Jesus. God bless your heart. We'll see you real soon. Don't forget, if you want to give to Effective Life Church, if you're being fed through the ministry, then please go on to our homepage. All the details will be on screen for you, and you can give uh, a financial blessing there. If you want to uh, give into my own ministry, you can do exactly the same and go on to my website. Don't forget, please share. Please encourage people out there. Take care.